Um, I voiced this one right here, and it is the confrontation of Winry and Scar. The pandemic. How did we make the anime? <laughs> um, Welcome, Caitlin Glass, everyone. Yes. Yeah. So, hello. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So, do you want to name a few characters that you voice? Sure. Well, um, I voice this one right here. Uh, <laughs> who am I, though? You're Princess Vivi from One Piece. Oh, right. <laughs> the One Piece. Um, but you might know me as Winry Rockwell from Full Metal Alchemist. Or Haruki Fujioka from uh, that one show. Or on High School Host Club. Uh, let's see. I am also Mina Ashido right now in My Hero Academia. And I'm Petra in Attack on Titan. I've been Vados in uh, Dragon Ball Super. I am Damien Desmond right now in Spy Family. That's so cool. <laughs> Thank you. My day job actually is being a voice director. So you probably have seen a lot of the shows that I direct uh, if you haven't heard me in anything lately. So it's uh, with Crunchyroll, I believe. Yes. Yes. Crunchyroll. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming you started voice actress and then you became director? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did you want to like go through that transition? I was mostly just looking for something to keep myself busy, uh, to be able to keep working in anime while I was in between voice roles, because you can only voice act as often as you are cast. You know, that's not up to me. <laughs> uh, so I really enjoyed working at what was then Funimation, and I just asked if they had a need, and they did. So. I started doing it and I'm still doing it. <laughs> That's so cool. Which one do you prefer? Do you like prefer voice acting or directing? Mm, I guess, well, they're two very different jobs. Mm -hmm. of, they just happen to be telling the same types of stories, telling anime stories. Uh, when you're acting, all you have to be concerned about is yourself and your character. And so that's very freeing. When you're a director, you're concerned with everything. You know, the, the one person you're working with at that time, but also every other actor, how it's all going to sound when it's put together, the way that it's written. Um, so they're really different. I guess acting is a little more, there's more freedom, less to worry about. Uh, but the responsibility of directing is also nice. And I like... Um, I like working with the actors, so I don't prefer one to the other. I oh, like I like them both because yeah. they're two, they're very different. Oh, that's yeah. so interesting. So, uh, voice directing for anime dubs uh, at Crunchyroll requires casting all of the actors, choosing who will play all of the characters, and uh, then you have to do boring stuff like paperwork and turning in requests for actors and how many hours and all of that. Um, but then the actors come in one at a time to record uh, their lines. So you work with the actor and an engineer. So it's just three people at a time. It is not like uh, if you've seen behind the scenes of Disney movies or something where it's all the actors and they get to talk to each other. Dubbing is not that way. It is one actor at a time because we have to match the animation that's already made. So it's very precise. So you can only do one person at a time. Uh, but the director sits there and uh, when the actor comes in, it, it, they haven't um, watched the episode. They have not read the script before. Everything is happening right then. And they are only concerned with the scenes of the episode that they are in. That we're not gonna watch the whole thing and then work. So it's the director's job to establish everything for the actor as they begin every new scene. Everything that they might need to know about their character, what's gone on before uh, that they weren't involved in, we set all of that up for them. Then you'll watch the scene together in Japanese, and then you'll watch a few lines that they're about to do in Japanese. And there's a one screen with a video and one screen with a script on it. And after you've watched it once, and that's the first time the actors are seeing their lines, ever, <laughs> is then. So, you know, they have that 30 seconds to a minute 
to preview and decide, and they're looking back and forth between the script and the video, and then you record it. And it's my job to let them know what kind of adjustments they need to make. So again, they can stay focused on being the character and bringing them to life and uh, trying to match the timing, but they don't have to figure out what is wrong, quote unquote, with what they just did. That's my job. So they'll record it. Everything is recorded digitally. So the engineer can then use his mouse, use their mouse and move the files around, change them, make them a little longer, a little shorter if we need. And if it still doesn't fit, then I'll tell the actor, okay, come back in and uh, I need this first part to be faster, this last part to be slower. Or maybe I have some acting notes, like, oh, I would like this to be bigger, smaller, louder, sadder, more angry, whatever, whatever the acting notes are. And so we'll, we'll do it again until that piece is done. And then we move on to the next section, get all the way through the episode, and that's just one actor. And then you have to get through, you know, it's usually about 12 to 15 characters per episode, and all of the big characters, the one-line people, or the group scenes, you know, a classroom, a shopping mall, whatever. Um, so one episode of anime is about 23 minutes, and it will take about 20 15 to 20 hours to record that one episode. Uh, after everything's recorded, this is a long answer. It's, it's very involved. <laughs> it's a very involved job. After all of the actors are recorded, I have to uh, watch the whole episode with my engineer and make any other adjustments. Um, we have to do things like put lines that are mental lines, like the actor, the character is thinking, they're not speaking out loud. They go on a different you know, track in the audio recording program uh, to get a filter put on it that sounds like a, a thought. Um, anything that needs adjustments like that, we'll add all of that. And then it gets turned in and sent off to another uh, engineer entirely called the mix engineer. And about two days later, or less than two days later, I will get it back, the episode back, and I'll hear what you guys would hear when you watch it. Um, streaming on your computer or maybe on television if it's going on television. So then all of the levels have been adjusted, right? And all of the sound effects have been adjusted really to make the explosions very big or your voice to sound like you're in a cave or you're underwater or where, wherever the character is. All of that has been added. Um, so I listen again to make sure everything can be heard and understood. The plot can be heard, the jokes are landing. They're not getting covered up by the music or the sound effects. Uh, I send off my notes, then I'll watch it yet again. And when everything is okay, we say, okay, off it goes. And I do that for two episodes a week. And everything airs within days of me saying, okay, good. And then you'll, and you'll be online to watch. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> I wish I could say that I had seen them all so that I could choose, but I haven't. As you know, there are over a thousand episodes. Yeah. And when you work on anime for a living, it honestly becomes difficult to watch anime for fun. I, I literally look at anime 40 hours a week. So when I go home, I don't really want to watch any more anime. But the hype surrounding One Piece lately has made me want to go back and start over. Um, so I, of course, love the Alabasta arc because... We're in it. Um, we're in it. An arc that really uh, is, I guess, close to my heart or it is fun for me is the Skypea arc of all things. Because when we started working on One Piece at Funimation, maybe even before I knew that I would play BB, uh, we had to start dubbing at the spot where the previous dubbing company left off. So it was being done by four kids. As you know, they made some choices. Choices were made. Choices. Um, and uh, we took over, and our cast had to still pick up where they left off because it was airing on television. So that meant Skypea. And we also had to do things both ways. So we had to say, like, Zolo and Zoro. We had to do, like, we had to, it was really bizarre, for a while anyway. Uh, so Skypea is where we were, and I was directing at the time, and so we were doing all this one piece at once. In one room, they were starting over from the beginning, 
the way we wanted it to be, closer to the Japanese. And then in another room, we're moving forward at Skypea. So I got to do both of those uh, directing-wise. So I really love the beginning, like the very, very beginning. And what is it when they, is it when they first meet Usopp? And there's like that mayor and the little dog. Love, oh, I directed choo -choo. those. Yeah, choo -choo. Choo -choo. Oh my gosh, so cute. I love that. And then Skypea is just ridiculous. It was a, a big uh, lesson in how cartoony we would get to be because of one piece. Like here, you're directing this and these people talk like goats. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, great, let's do it. Let's go, here we go. Uh, so really fun stuff in that arc. What made me want to start voice acting? Um, so I already knew that I wanted to be an actor and I was doing that. I almost was finished with university with a degree in theater and I've always loved cartoons and I've always been interested in anime since I was young. And then it just so happens that Funimation is in the city where I went to college. And I met a friend at church who worked for Funimation as an engineer. So I had an interest in voice acting, but I wasn't pursuing it to make it my job. Acting, whatever that meant, was going to be my job. And if anything, I, want, I imagined going off to England and going to graduate school and doing Shakespeare and stuff for the rest of my life. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, but I ended up with an audition at Funimation before I had even finished college. And that's when I started doing case clothes. And I just did small things uh, for a few months. And then it was the summer after graduation and I got a bigger part in something. And then uh, Christopher Sabat, you probably know him as Vegeta and All Might and many, 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 many other things. Uh, he said to me, he's like, you're, you're really good at this. Maybe you should keep doing this <laughs> uh, as opposed to, you know, moving to another country for graduate school or something like that. And so I'm not saying it was at his advice that I stayed, but it really made me think twice about it, you know, like, huh. Maybe, maybe he's right, and it's true, it's a very difficult industry to break into. So I decided, well, I'll at least keep at it for a while and see what happens. And a lot of the time for actors, if they're going to go to graduate school for the stage, they recommend waiting a few years anyway. Don't go straight, straight out of undergrad. So that's what I thought I would do. I'm like, okay, I'll stay around here. I'll do some theater. I'll do some anime. But then anime just kind of took over. <laughs> just took over. And uh, here we are now, 20 years later, <laughs> still, still doing it. Okay. Well, often when you reprise a character, you're starting over at the beginning of a story. So uh, you have to look at it from that way. So even though I had played all the way through Winry as we knew her and what her storyline and ending quote unquote would be, which is pretty crummy with the first go around of Full Metal Alchemist, um, I think it was very well executed though. So I never want to like poo poo on OG Full Metal or the Conqueror of Shambhala. Like there was such a big deal and groundbreaking when they came out and it's a beautiful movie. Um, it's just a sad ending, but hey, I actually kind of like sad endings and other things in general. I'm like, oh, that's more like real life. Um, <laughs> it's relatable. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so that's what had happened to Winry then. And then the opportunity to play her again is like, cool, I get to go spend more time with a friend, essentially and play her closer to uh, the source material. But everything that I do as a voice actor, especially for dubbing, is based on what I see in the moment when I step into the booth. To me, that's what makes the particular art of dub acting so unique from other things. There isn't text work, like when I do Shakespeare. There isn't rehearsal when I'm in a play or for actors who do on camera. Like, there isn't that. It's extremely um, organic and spontaneous. And I have something to make me feel a thing. That is the cartoon. I get to watch it in, in Japanese. And the way I feel about it initially is what I'm going to use to portray the character in that moment. Yeah. And then the director is there to help guide because sometimes as I'm watching it, I'm feeling what I should feel as an audience member, which might be different than what the character is feeling in, in that time. Um, and that's what's so cool about it. So of course, I cannot erase my previous experiences as the character, uh, but I just have to go off of where are they now in this moment. 
which honestly isn't so weird in the timeline of playing an anime, even if it only has one season, because animes often jump around in time. Like, you've spent time with this character for 10 episodes, and then episode 11, let's do a flashback to when they were 10 years old. Okay. Right? And so I have to go play that character and pretend like I don't know anything about their future. That's uh, really common in anime, actually. So reprising a role is um, it's just part of, part of the job. That is slightly different than your question. So yeah. Um, and it's kind of like limited. You can only pick one. You can only do one thing. I feel like as soon as I answer, I'm gonna go, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, I'll think of something else. Okay, so my favorite anime, which might be a question that someone was going to ask, it's not it's sort of obscure because I like slice of life. That's my favorite genre. My favorite anime is called Honey and Clover. It's beautiful, and there's a manga, and I rewatch the show every few years. And I first found it when I was still a brand new voice actor and had just graduated from college, as I mentioned. And I really connected with the show because it's about a group of artists. And while they are all um, physical, physical artists, what are they? visual artists, <laughs> right? Like painters, potters, architects, things of that nature, and I'm an actor, the show gives you a peek into their world at university, the time that they spend with one another. And in the years after, as each one of them graduates, like um, in a staggered way, um, just struggling with being an artist and being human and um, how you relate to one another and finding love or the lack thereof. And like, it's just so good. And the music is beautiful. And it did receive a dub, um, but it was so early in my acting that I didn't have any, um, my, in my voice acting. I didn't have any connections with that studio that did it. Um, I've never, I think I've tried to watch the dub, but I'm so in love with the Japanese version because of what it means to me that like, I can't even watch it. My friends are in it too. I'm like, oh, turn that off. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell them. And I'll just watch it in Japanese. But if, if I could have been uh, in that as the character of Yamada, who is this uh, red-haired, blue-eyed person, no. Um, <laughs> that's I would have loved that. I still I still adore it. And if you've never seen it, I highly recommend watching it. It's beautiful. Gosh, I have a few questions. Sure. If we can. Yeah. If you guys want yeah, to think, think, about, think of something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I kind of saw at your in your Instagram that I think you were at Disney not too long ago. I was on what day is today? Today Saturday. Yeah. I was there on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> so you just came back like recently. Yes. So would there be like Film or a character you'd like to voice maybe in a ah. Disney movie? What's your favorite one? <laughs> my favorite Disney, well, it's interesting you say that because my favorite Disney movie does not have voiced characters. My favorite Disney movie is Fantasia. Oh, yeah. Oh, actually. <laughs> uh, and I've loved it since I was a child. It was probably my first like, full on exposure to classical music. And then shortly after that, I started learning to play an instrument and learning music. So it's, it is very, very special to me. Um, so I'm like, well, I can't really be in Fantasia. <laughs> but other than that, a big part of my life is The Little Mermaid. Um, I was uh, eight years old when The Little Mermaid came out. And I remember going to the theater with my mom and we missed the first few minutes of the film. And I was so upset. And so when it ended, and of course it was fantastic, I told my mom, like, you have to stay so I can see the part that we missed. And back in those days, you could get away with that. You know? uh, maybe you still can't now. But so we stayed, and then my mom fell asleep, and I just got to watch the whole movie again. <laughs> so I watched it twice, twice in a row. Yeah. And then when I turned 16 years old was the year that they put The Little Mermaid back out into theaters. So that would have been 1997. And uh, it was a big deal because, you know, in the movie, Ariel's like, I'm 16 years old, I'm not a child. I'm like, that's me, that's me. <laughs> uh, so I, I've always loved The Little Mermaid, and I've had the pleasure of meeting Jody Benson a couple of times, uh, which is wild. Like, just because of my career, I've had the chance to meet her. Um, so not that there would be a need for a new Ariel, uh, because if they need, it, you know, traditional Ariel, they still have Jody. She still does it, still sounds like it. She's phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, I, I did enjoy the new movie, and I think that uh, the live-action Ariel is so lovely in her voice. She's so pretty. So, awesome. She's so sweet. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, so if I could be just maybe in the Little Mermaid universe, how's that? That would yeah, be great. That's cool. <laughs>
I mean, sometimes even video games need voice actors. That's true. So That's true. They don't always get the like the current voice actors, so sometimes they get someone. Yeah, to match. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll I mean, take it. Some of the most difficult voice acting would have been back in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and it is the confrontation of Winry and Scar. Hands down, the most difficult. <laughs> Um, yep. I was also directing that episode, so I had to direct myself, which um, is fine, and truthfully, I think uh, for that scene, I prefer it. <laughs> it would have been harder with someone else there picking at it, um, but whenever a character is extremely emotional and they're crying and you're also trying to match all of their body movements, how big their mouth is or how small when they're sniffing and snotting and all of that, and then also carry across the point uh, of the moment. So she just runs, literally runs the gamut of emotions there um, that I needed to show. So that's some of the hardest stuff uh, that I ever had to do. And it's interesting. So you mentioned about, um, playing a character, reprising them, or if you could go back, or if you could do something from, you know, before your time. Uh, when we were doing Full Metal Alchemist the first time around, I was at a convention in 2005 and uh, Someone came up to me, and I was still new to the fact, to the to the knowledge of there's a manga, right? There's a source material, and learning that the manga was different from what the original show ended up uh, portraying. And so a fan came up to me, and they're like, "Do you want to know what really happened to Winry's parents? Because it's different in the manga and Brotherhood than what." was in the first show. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And so they show me the pages. I'm like, no way. And some of them were maybe still in Japanese. And then they showed me the confrontation of Winry and Scar. And I was like, that is amazing. Too bad I will never get to do that. Right? <laughs> Until 2009 when I got to do that. Or 2010? 2010. Maybe I wasn't directing it. I could have been because it was really... It, we started Brotherhood, and then I moved to Spain, and then I was gone. You know what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I, but I, I did it. <laughs> uh, and then you'd think, okay, that's it. You did that hard thing. You'll never have to do it again. Fast forward to just last year, or maybe even early this year. Maybe it was earlier this year. Um, dubbing the Full Metal Alchemist live action films. Yeah, so there are three of them. I did the first one in 2017, and then the second one last year, same time I was out in LA doing Street Fighter VI. And then, yeah, earlier this year, I believe, is when I did part three. And that's all of the awful, winry, crying, scar confrontation yet again. <laughs> like, oh my goodness, what? make it stop. Um, but at the same time, it was still very special to get to revisit her again. Uh, like, she's, she's the gift that keeps on giving, I suppose. <laughs> A lot of folks who are quick to kind of poop on dubs haven't watched a good one. <laughs> Seriously. And they're all just part of that crew of people that think it's fun to hate on a thing. Uh, honestly, <laughs> dubs have come a long way. So maybe people who say that imagine like Speed Racer from the 1960s, <laughs> you know? Uh, or even some of the early 80s dubs. Or they are watching, as an adult, uh, an anime cartoon that was perhaps one that was made for kids. Not all anime is for adults. Some is for teens and some is for children. Um, but they may have the misconception that all anime is for like teens or adults. So maybe they're watching a kid's show. Um, the concept of something like Shonen, right? Like One Piece, Naruto, Bleach, etc., which sometimes is really in the same episode, youthful and goofy and silly and then extreme and you killed my parents and I'm going to kill you back, you know, whatever, all in one thing. So there can be, a, a, like you said, sort of like a lack of understanding of the source material, the source audience um, that can lead to that. Uh, and then, yeah, I, there's also um, a phenomenon. Whoever has heard the phrase, like, the book is better than the movie? Yeah, and oftentimes we read the book, we love it, we see the movie and it falls short. Is it really because the movie is terrible? Sometimes yes, but sometimes it's just because you have a preconceived notion of what it should be. And when you're reading something, you imagine all of it in your mind, what they look like based on the description, what the location is based on the description, and what you imagine is perfect. 
it's perfect. So when you see it on screen and it doesn't live up to what you thought, it's bad. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So uh, go with me here. It's a little bit of a stretch. But when you watch a uh, subtitled anime, of course you have the picture. So you have what it should look like. You hear the Japanese voice, and then you read your subtitle in English or in French, and you are imagining the perfect performance of the language that you speak. And you maybe are not even capturing the Japanese actor's performance. I hope that you do, but if you don't, you know, that's just part of how our brains work. So you've already got it in your mind what it should be like when, you know, Naruto confronts whoever, and then you hear it in English, and you're like, ugh. Right? Because it doesn't live up to your expectation of that, when truthfully, I think Miley Flanagan is hilarious and a great Naruto. Um, so that's kind of the difference between subs and dubs. And then there's the, the uh, argument that, oh, uh, dubs are an adaptation and it's not exactly the translation. Newsflash, a subtitle is also an adaptation and is not a direct translation. <laughs> And they have to adapt. I know. Can you believe that, kids at home? Um, yeah. So they subtitles, the translations have to be adapted in a number of ways for a Western audience to understand them. Also, for the number of words that are allowed to fit across the bottom of the screen that you can conceivably read in the amount of time that you have them. So sometimes a dub does a better job of conveying the language because we have the freedom to speak it. And you can hear faster than you can read it. Uh, most of the time. So I think they're both wonderful. Like I'm honestly not, not poo-pooing sub lovers or dub lovers. I just think anime is great and we're blessed to have it. So enjoy it in whatever way you like the best and stop telling other people how they should enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. someone you guys have great questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> it is a very complicated question. And anime, I think because the fandom for anime has in, in dubs, has almost always had access to the actors in a way that is not true about movies. You know, there aren't just conventional, there are conventions every weekend, it seems, nowadays, where <laughs> there are film actors there, but they're all from the kind of the nerd fandom type stuff. You know, I'm not going there to go see somebody from an indie film talk about their whatever. Anyway, so fans have always been able to reach out to us in some way uh, much more easily and readily than other forms of acting, which I think gives fans a bit of um, entitlement uh, to how it should sound because fans feel like we are the ones who made you. And I'm like, well, not, not really. I have a degree in theater. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I study for this. Um, so yes, it seems uh, an anime dubbing in the whole world of voiceover also seems to be viewed as like bottom tier or kind of an entry level, let's call it entry level, that's a little less negative sounding. Um, but many of us find our niche in it and it's a happy place for us. And even if we go on to do other things like AAA video games or pre-lay animation for Disney or something, maybe we still love anime and want to keep doing it. Why should I be pushed out um, because of People are like, we want new voices. I'm like, the old voices don't suck. In fact, they become masters of their craft. They've spent thousands of hours in the booth. And uh, I can tell you as a director, we have to work faster and faster nowadays. So the people who really know how to do it can do it. And any actor off the street, even me, when I first started voice acting, it takes an amount of time for you to learn the skill set that's required for dubbing. And even now that there are classes out there to teach you how to dub anime, it pales in comparison to what it's actually like to be doing the work and coming in on a weekly basis or every couple of weeks. And uh, if you aren't cast in a bigger part, which is normal, there are only a few big parts per show. So if you are a minor role in something, you're only gonna come in and work on nowadays one episode at a time. So when I started, we were putting things out in batches or whole volumes or a whole series. It had already come out in Japan. People knew about it. It was popular. So they went, hey, let's put it into English. So when I came in to work on something, I was doing six episodes, 12 episodes at a time. So even as a minor character, that's still hours of work at once to really work on that muscle. And how do I, how do, I do this or wrap your brain around it? 
But now, because of the demand and because we want to combat piracy, everything is streaming and is coming out at the same time as Japan or within a week or two, which is just mind blowing when you stop and think about it, how much it's changed just in the 20 years since I've been doing this. But that means for you as a minor character, you're only coming in for the episodes that you're in, which may not be every week. And maybe you have 15 minutes of work every two weeks. And then there'll be your one episode where you have an hour's worth of work. And you know, by the end, it's cool because you were in most of the show. Um, but did you really get the hang of doing this? It's going to take you seasons and seasons and seasons before you'll maybe make it into a, a bigger role. So it is a, it's a, it's very tricky. Casting is very tricky. And I think there are also maybe directors out there who are seeking to make a name for themselves by discovering an actor, which I think is just a whole other conversation to be had. Um, I'm just looking for people who are good actors. Actor first, voice actor second. Yeah, that's that's what I'm looking for. I don't know if that really answers your question or at least gives you something to chew on. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. It's the pandemic. The pandemic. How did we make the anime? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm really proud of the work that Funimation and Crunchyroll were able to do during the pandemic and truly pioneering some methods to make it work. In a place like Dallas or Houston in Texas, where there's a lot of dubbing, it's pretty normal for actors to not have a home studio. You never really needed one because the majority of your work was dub work and you would go in to do it. Um, in Los Angeles, it was maybe a little more common to have a home studio because you were doing a lot more auditions at home um, but most of us in Texas didn't have that setup going on. And so Crunchyroll Funimation, with their own money, um, made kits, acting kits, and sent them out to the actors. Like, here's a mic, here's an iPad, we've got this program. They came up with kind of a universal system so that we could get everybody back to work as soon as possible. And not because we're like, we need to make money, but because everyone was stuck at home with nothing to do. So for the morale of all of the directors, all of the staff at Crunchyroll, and the actors, of course, um, and then the fans at home. We, we all thought anime. the world was ending, <laughs> uh, okay? And it just kept getting worse. <laughs> so uh, the fact that we had something to work on was so important. And uh, the methods grew and kind of evolved over the course of those two or three work from home years. Um, eventually a lot of individual actors started upgrading their own home studios of their own volition, buying fancier mics and uh, different uh, equipment. We started utilizing a different way to record it. Um, and one really cool thing that came of it, if something good could happen from such a mess, is uh, because of remote recording, we started using actors from different regions more frequently. Uh, because everybody was recording from home anyway, so you didn't have to live in Dallas anymore. Uh, or, you know, I was doing a lot of more work for Los Angeles than I had ever done before, even though I was at home in, in Texas. So that happened. Uh, since coming back, um, well, we even had a time during the pandemic where the director was at home at their house, the engineer was at home at their house, like through the internet, remote controlling a rig, that was in a studio in Dallas, and then the actor was wherever they were, or maybe at the studio in Dallas by themselves. So it was like you know, contactless, right? You would go in, wash your hands, go into your studio, do your work. When you left, someone came in and sanitized the whole thing. So if you didn't have a good setup at your house and you did live near the studio, you could just go work at the studio. Um, then March of last year, we reopened uh, the studios in person. And now the majority of recording is in person. Yeah, if you were cast in something during the pandemic and you don't live in Dallas, you're still in it and we record you remotely. Um, but a lot of new casting is, it, it, local is preferred because you're like, why? You have to think of the scale. So at Crunchyroll, we're putting out anywhere from 20 to 30 dubs every season. So 20 to 30 episodes of anime every week. That's a lot of mixing. I talked about the process of things. We all record it in another one porcelain. 
I didn't expect that to happen, Jesus. Which house would I personally side with, like, with Joe Zijin's side with, and why? Uh, 